Welcome to VLGA Connect. My name is Catherine Arndt and I'm the Chief of the VLGA Connect Studio. I hope you enjoy today's Connect episode brought to you by the VLGA, the national broadcaster on all things local government. Greetings. Welcome to VLGA Connect. It's time for another governance update brought to you by Hunt and Hunt Lawyers. And joining me as always is Steve Cooper to talk about the week's news in local government circles. Stephen, how are you? Chris, I'm well, but not as formally attired as you. Greetings. Well, you know, uh, when we're recording this, which is late on uh, Friday, I've literally come from another event. So, you know, I don't want to shame you in terms of dress uh, it's <laughs> it's just one of those things uh, i am um, in fact i was in a suit for most of the day <laughs> you've changed out of it got home and into, into some woolly attire because that's where i thought you were going anyway fair enough look such is life and um it, it's been a sad day uh with the passing of queen elizabeth ii of course we do need to uh note that um and talk a bit about the uh, the impact on councils, which is minimal, but there are some impacts, aren't there? Well, the impacts are non-impacts, Chris, because I saw that um, in the media this morning that uh, all state government MPs were going to need going to need to um, redo their oaths uh, of allegiance because the way that the Constitution Act is framed requires that that needs to be done with a new monarch. But um, oh. I was working on the presumption in local government that because our councillors have sworn allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law, that we're covered. That was forward thinking on the part of the, the framers <laughs> for the local government oath and not so forward thinking for the framers of the Constitution Act. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe it was meant. I'm not sure, Chris. Um, and I know a number of councils have been thinking through um, what to do with the half-masting of flags and there's some advice coming out about that. I know of one council with a major, rather prominent flag that doesn't have a half-mast setting, so that flag's just gone for a while. Oh, okay. Yeah. Problematic. Uh, there, there was some advice that came out late today uh, from ALGA uh, after some consultation with the Federal Minister's Office, Christy McBain, around citizenship ceremonies, for example, uh, they should continue to take place and the Queen's portrait should continue to be uh, displayed, particularly through the period of mourning. And of course, there needs to be some sort of formal proclamation, I think, of King Charles III as the new sovereign. And until that happens, the portraits don't change over. Um, and uh, council meetings aren't impacted, even though Federal Parliament is so I, I guess what i hear you saying chris is there is you know once you've got the flags at half mast there's no need for an unholy haste um seek and receive good advice and we'll respond in a measured way yes and uh and and listen out for further details on uh, future protocols as uh, as that occurs in the coming weeks a yep. pretty significant uh, event in all of our lifetimes uh steve well, none of us know another monarch, Chris. So, um, absolutely, and we are a constitutional monarchy, so it has, it does have implications. Yeah, sure does. Uh, another story that's been getting a bit of attention this week, and I don't want to blow this out of uh, proportion, Steve, but uh, some councillor behaviour in the the north of the state has uh, has been getting a run in the media, and we're talking about Ganawara Shire Council. I think you're aware of the uh, the statement that was made on social media and a follow-up statement that was made on social media but is no longer there, and that's one thing I want to come back to in a second. What's your take on this? I'm a bit like you, Chris. I'm reluctant to delve too far into the details other than to say it relates to a comment that has been described um, by others as sexist and misogynistic. I think, Chris, the thing that struck me is sometimes... Um, some people are inclined to think of such comments as almost um, victimless. Um, there's no harm that you know, maybe we should all just move on. Um, now, again, I don't want to make a judgment on the particular issue, but I think speaking generally, um, one of the things that, well, two things that really strike me as being important. One is we've had a Royal Commission into Family Violence uh, where one of the findings, a key finding was that um, 
gendered language, particularly by males, is one of the power dynamics that has led to us as a nation um, having an appalling record on domestic violence that leads to a, you know one woman being killed per week, mm. and you know multiply that by however many in terms of the number of acts of violence, and it is you know predominantly men in relation to women. Um, these sorts of comments perpetuate that situation, and we should um, be always mindful of that. And I think the other one, Chris, is there is no council that can. Um, can rest comfortably um, in the light of the Vago report into um, sexual harassment in yeah. local government from a couple of years ago. And while, you know, there are consistent reports of over 30% of the, you know, population in organisations, you know, reporting having received sexual harassment and less than 5% being prepared to report um, more formally, uh, we all should be looking at creating an environment that is safe and inclusive. And if there are comments to the contrary, uh, then they need to be dealt with. I, I think that's really well said. I, I just want to make it clear, one of the, one of the reasons, the main reason, um, I don't particularly want to make too much of this. I mean, the comment as reported is, in my view, inappropriate. But there may be a process in train, I don't know. There's been comments from other councillors. There could be a code of conduct uh, process that's in train. Certainly, don't want to um, muddy those waters in any way. I think we've always tried to be pretty consistent on that, Chris. That you know, where the processes should take their course, they should take their course. Yeah. And um, yeah, we're not yeah we're not about to muddy those waters. Um, one comment I would make more generally, Chris, and it's again not about this one in particular, but if you were reviewing comments that one sees on social media, um, a yardstick might be if the CEO or a board member of an ASX listed top 100 company uh, made those comments, what would happen? What yeah. would happen to that person? You know, yeah. That might be a yard test, yeah, a yardstick. Now you, um, you mentioned something about social media and you were going to go down. A yeah, I just want to make the point that uh, in this particular case, when you look at the media reports, there are screenshots of a follow-up comment by the councillor in question that have reportedly now been deleted. But I think there's a real lesson in there. I don't know how long it was up for, but it seems to me these days it only needs to be up for a minute <laughs> and someone somewhere somehow has captured it. There is something about social media. I don't know if your radar is like mine, Chris. From time to time, I'll see something and think, oh, I'll screenshot that. Mm. Um, and I know, you know, sometimes people are lulled into a sense of a sense of security. I was about to say sense of insecurity. I'm using Snapchat because they think that once read, it disappears. And yeah. to your point, absolutely, um, it's pretty likely that um, material will be screenshotted. Yeah. All right. So I, I, I just think that's a bit of a... A lesson for us all, perhaps, mm. to take, take out of this. And uh, we'll wait and see what more might occur on that and uh, comment accordingly at a future point in time. Uh, in some happier news that's uh, come out this week, the Prime Minister has addressed, I think it was CEDA, the Economic Development Group, uh, State of the Union address, I think they called it. Uh, and uh, he has quite clearly said that this government intends to re-establish the Australian Council of Local Governments, which is great news, and uh, that the community infrastructure funding model will be looked at, won't be based on the electoral map, I think was his comment, and talked very much, very positively about the uh, the power, the responsibility, uh, the, the 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 knowledge locally that councils have to be making decisions about how infrastructure funds are spent at the local level, which again I thought was very welcome. Chris, that's welcome news. Um, probably a couple of areas where there's still some uncertainty as to what will that consultation or that council of local governments actually look like. Um, and the other part that really interests me, and I'll have to get my head around the idea of. Um, federal funding not being related to electoral districts. So um, <laughs> we'll watch that space with interest. Um, but there is no doubt. I mean, the whole issue around constitutional recognition of local government is as much as anything about the financial security of councils. So, um, uh -huh. yeah. You must have seen you must have seen the interview that Catherine and I have recorded with the Federal Minister Christy McBain on that very topic. You were just waiting for an opportunity to say that you'd talk to the Federal Minister, weren't you? 
We have talked to the Federal Minister. That'll be coming out next week. And we did ask her about this announcement that the, uh, the Prime Minister made. And she gave us a little more detail. The intention is that there'll be this gathering around the time of the National General Assembly next year. Uh, and every council in Australia will be invited to attend. I can't imagine all 537, I want to say, um, will be able to attend. But that'll be a pretty big gathering uh, and a pretty strong signal about that federal to local engagement in action. I'll look forward to listening to that next week, Chris. Thank you. No problem, Stephen. Now, uh, City of Melbourne this week, back in the news. We might have flagged this last week. I can't remember, but uh, they have yeah, received an options paper at their committee meeting on Tuesday night and, and endorsed the direction, which means that they're joining this movement to seek a change of date for Australia Day i.e. move it away from the 26th of uh, January and undertake more activities that are sensitive to sentiments of Aboriginal people in relation to that date. Yeah, Chris, we discussed this last week, I think. I think our listener is alert to our views okay. on the matter. Good. That, so that, that one person uh, can let us know if uh, they want some more info, information and, and we'll, that. Yeah, we'll gladly come back next week. And... <laughs> <laughs> the... Um, uh, the countback, I want to get this right, the countback at Horsham Rural City Council occurred this week and there's a new councillor on that council, Steve. It's uh, Dr Bob Redden, or Robert Redden, I think. I've seen uh, reports uh, where Councillor Redden has been described as both, or Councillor Dr Redden, or... Yeah. Yes, I don't know what the protocol I'm is. I'm not there. sure. <laughs> well, you, you, would, you don't say Councillor Mister or Councillor Ms, so you probably wouldn't say Councillor Doctor. No, I don't think so. Um, we're getting into the deep, we're getting deep into the important issues here now, and I haven't thought this through. But my gut says you don't use the doctor as well as the councillor. No, I think you're right. Yeah. All right. So welcome to Councillor Redden, who's obviously completed all his eligibility declarations because he's been sworn in. Took the oath of office yesterday, Thursday. I saw those saw those shots, and yeah, again, congratulations to Councillor Redden. Um, and we wish him well. In more councillor news, there's uh, another councillor standing. Now, I don't profess to have caught all of these, Stephen, but I did notice a councillor at La Trobe is standing as an independent candidate at the state election. That's councillor Tracy Lund, who's a first-time councillor, also the manager of the Morwell Neighbourhood House. So she's putting her hand up for state election. Chris, did we also catch the fact that councillor Federico at Bayside is standing uh, as an independent. No, I, former mayor, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes. Um, Felicity, isn't it? Yes. Yes. No, I don't think we did. Thank you. Well, there's, there's another, another one. one. Yeah. Late breaking news, although I think that's been around for a while. Someone asked if we're keeping a list, and sorry, uh, I just don't have the capacity to keep another list. There are some lists that I'm keeping, and we'll get to some new entries on that in just a, in a, just a little while. But if anyone would like to take up that responsibility and share it with us, I'd be much obliged. Eternally grateful, I think, Chris, we would be. Yes, indeed. Uh, and there's a by-election coming up in Bull Oak, as we're aware, in Mallee Ward, and the nominations are open for that as we speak until I think it's midday this coming Tuesday and election day there is Saturday the 15th of October. Yes, to replace Councillor David Viz, as I recall, who's uh, resident of Sea Lake. So uh, mm -hmm. candidates from that particular region. You recall correctly. A uh, little bit further west and over the border, Mount Gambier and the District Council of Grant are in the news this week, uh, Stephen, because the Premier of South Australia has announced that uh, voters, when we come to local government election time a little later this year, are going to be asked to vote in a plebiscite on whether those two councils should be merged. This has clear, according to media reports, this has clearly come as a bit of a surprise to those councils. <laughs> That's extraordinary, Chris. I've got to say, I am absolutely torn on this um, particular topic because I'm not aware of a similar plebiscite in the past, although there may have been one and mm. would welcome any correction. But I just wonder, in the emotion that goes with mergers and demergers as to whether a plebiscite is actually the thing that's in the interests um, of the community. It's, it's you know interesting, I mean. isn't it? Because it's it, it'll be non-binding, so the result won't actually have any impact. I think what the Premier has said, if if there's is there's appetite, community appetite, uh, there'll be further work done 
and further consultation uh, before proceeding. Uh, but what he has also said is this is a bit of a trial run for potential mergers elsewhere in the state in the future. Mm. It's an interesting model because it would be, oh, because I had presumed that um, asking for a plebiscite was smart politics. But if the plebiscite finds for the merger, it would be, um, what, would they, what would you say, Chris? Politically courageous minister to, <laughs> to not continue down that path. Yeah. Having created the expectation. Yeah. It, it will be very interesting to see how that plays out. Very different, of course, to the proposed amalgamations that are happening in Tasmania, which are being driven from some of the councils. Mm. They don't have all the surrounding councils on board is the way I'm reading it through the media. Um, and that's part of a future local government review that's ongoing in that state at the moment. So there's a bit to watch around the sector at the moment, I think. Oh, my word, Chris. As Keep well as the going. review of the rate peg in New South Wales, which I think we mentioned uh, last week. We did uh, indeed. So um, we want to give some bouquets and brickbats, as you call them, this week, Stephen, as we were working through the stories that have popped up, I mentioned a couple and you said, oh, let's do bouquets and brickbats. So which one do you think gets the bouquet? I thought, um, I think it was the Adelaide Advertiser doing a report that you're quite familiar with around uh, code of conduct complaints. They did. They released some statistics on, I think it was 21 code of conduct complaint matters that have been dealt with in this term on Adelaide City Council. And the story was really about the cost, the legal fees, which amounted to, I think, just over $130,000 for those 21. Only nine of those 21 were substantiated. Right. And I, and I mean, the reason why I would give that a bouquet is I think anything that we can do to reinforce that there is a cost associated um, with those proceedings where matters might otherwise just be mediated away at a far lesser cost and in a way that is more likely to preserve relationships. Um, you know, How do you feel about this one then, Stephen? I think, it was, I think it was the same day in the Adelaide Advertiser, they published a league table on the salaries of the CEOs of every council in the state <sighs> of South Australia. And you, you haven't seen the story. I, I reckon you could just about write the narrative that went with it without even seeing it. Oh, Chris, I fell asleep while you were telling me about it. Mean, oh, oh, thanks team. very much. <laughs> oh, no, it wasn't you. It was like, oh, a league table of CEOs. So, and, gee, I wonder, maybe the one that's at the top is the biggest, most complex council with the most revenue, and the one that's sort of near the bottom is kind of a rural one that's quite small, and they range somewhere in between. Is that how it goes? Yeah, I think that's probably right. Yeah. yeah. And, well and if there's any aberrations, maybe there was something going on in terms of the recruitment process that they wanted to pay more for a particular counsellor or that they've got a, a, a salary, heaven forbid, a salary strategy that puts them at a particular limit. Like, really. Can you, get, can you have a guess at the descriptor they might have used to describe CEOs earning those salaries? Oh, uh, Please, Chris, tell me they didn't call them fat cats. Hey, bingo. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. See, I told you you could write it without even seeing it. Oh, if you don't mind, how lacking in imagination. Like, really, can we come up with something new? <laughs> yep. No, 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 just no, don't come up with something new. Just get off it. You've, you oh, know, as, yeah. as, as old Joe Bielke Peterson would have said, they've got their foot on the sticky paper. <laughs> the, where are they? the chooks. Just feed the chooks. <laughs> Now, uh, sorry, this is jumping the shark for a Friday night. I think uh, you did have you did have a brick bat much closer to home down on uh, the Bass Coast. I'll, I'll tell you what, though, I'll give a bouquet first to Councillor Letitia Lang for call at Bass Coast Council for calling this out. Yeah. And and I didn't see on my LinkedIn feed which media and outlet it was, but one of the uh, there was a media report um, in relation to Bass Coast, Chris, that. Um, made a list of the most expensive to the least expensive counsellors yeah. based on um, childcare costs, travel costs, and um, professional development costs. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> like, really? So, um, I, yeah, I, yeah, I was, I was quite stunned. Shake like... your head. You've just got to shake your head. And, and this lowest common denominator tabloid journalism stuff is really starting to... What's the expression? Get my goat. <laughs> Get up your gander, does it, Chris? That's it. Uh, and look, it, it is serious in the sense that, you know, local government does really 
good, important, complex work in um, in tricky, chaotic environments, not of our own making. And I agree with you, this stuff is just a distraction um, from the important sort of public policy and, uh, you know, strategic kind of work that we do as councils. It's just, it, it is quite unhelpful. It, well, it's unhelpful and it just continues this devaluing in the public eye of local government as, as a level of government and uh, the importance that it should have attached to it. Well, I think we might stay on this theme, Chris, because the other thing it does is it sends a really weird signal for people who might be contemplating um, standing for council as to what success looks like yeah. and the reasons why they should stand. And, you know, we certainly know at the moment we should be doing everything possible to encourage good people to stand and to be successful in their roles in local government. And this mm. none of this sort of helps. No. So, so there. All right. So there, on on that, we'll leave that there. Uh, are we up to the classifieds now? Did you have any other issues of substance to raise? <laughs> no, I've almost, I've, I've nearly, I've got one more bit of editorialising to do, Chris, but I'm nearly there. So Because you're standing between Let's... me and my Friday night glass of wine, I've got to tell you. Well, I am um, sorry. <laughs> It's all right. Uh, some CEO news this week. Let's move through these. Uh, the the, uh, the CEO at Northern Grampians Shire of uh, nearly three years, Liana Thompson, has resigned this week. Uh, the resignation was accepted. I, I, I sensed reluctantly by the councillors in the chamber on Monday night, uh, Liana's moving back to the big smoke and taking up a director role at the city of Wyndham next month. Well done to the city of Wyndham and... Yeah, good luck to Northern Grampians Shire in finding a replacement for uh, the much respected Leanna Thompson. Absolutely. So that's another one on the list. That is a list that I'm keeping, which is got eight pending CEO appointments on it now, Stephen. One about to come off, I believe. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, Brendan McGrath at Wangaratta. Brendan's held the role there since 2014 as CEO and has just been extended on a new five-year contract, which will take him through to 2028. That just boggles my mind, starting to talk about dates like that, oh, 2028. Exactly. But more importantly, Brendan must be doing quite a lot that's right. So congratulations to him and the council on that appointment. Oh, a renewal, if you like. Yes. New contract, whatever you call it. Yeah. Now, the councillors at Warrnambool have, quote, considered all their options and chosen to explore the market for their CEO. The current CEO, Peter Schneider's contract is up early next year. Now we know the backstory here. The previous council dismissed Peter from that role. He successfully challenged it at the Supreme Court and was reinstated, I think in around June of last year. Um, no word yet on whether he's intending to reapply for his job. But he may. Um, Chris, I'm not reading anything in particular into this. It's not the first time a council has um, said to an existing CEO that we're going out to market, you're welcome to apply. And I, yeah. I'm thinking particularly um, a few years back where Craig Neiman at the city of Greater Bendigo was put in that uh, situation um, and successfully applied. Mm. So, you know, take it at face value, I think. Okay. And uh, this afternoon, we're recording this on a Friday evening at three o'clock, the uh, Campaspe Shire Council was having a special meeting and the one item of business on the agenda, it was a confidential item, of course, was headed recruitment of CEOs. So I'm thinking there might be something coming maybe next week in regards to the CEO at Campaspe Shire. I'm thinking, think is, uh, no, I'm thinking that there's another example of a council doing business on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> And well, if there's an announcement yeah. as soon as we finish recording, Chris. Uh, look, I'd like to give them the benefit of the doubt there. If they've made a, a decision, they've got contracts to ne negotiate, finalise, sign, etc. Probably next week, I would think, for an announcement. But let's wait and see. Absolutely. And someone will be, there will be some very fortunate person because there will be far worse places to work than, uh, than around uh, Echuca on the Murray River. Um, we're just assuming that they've reached a decision too. They might have some other decision that they're making with regard to that process today. Well, that's right. No. I think your assumptions are yeah, uh, unlikely to be too far off the mark, Chris. Let's wait and see. Yeah. And uh, you'd like to make a comment. We don't normally talk about director level appointments, but here's one, and, and I do know Blaga Namoski very well at Nillenbeck Shire, a terrific operator, has been elevated into a director of governance and communications position 
there. And you want to make some comments about that? I, that got my attention for two um, reasons, Chris. One is because Blaga is um, particularly competent and a yeah. real contributor um, to the sector. And, you know, that's a well-earned accolade for a governance manager to be elevated to the director role. It also raises an interesting question, I think, for any CEO is around what's the... Um, What's the level of agency that your chief governance advisor has in your organisation? Now, what this will do is really formalise for the already influential Blaganomovsky um, a place at the executive table. I know at other councils, uh, the governance personnel report direct to the CEO, um, but it's a really interesting and an important issue for organisations who care about culture and integrity is, um, is that advisor seen as as you know being someone worth listening to it's it's becoming more and more important isn't it with everything that's mm. happening in the sector now in the age of monitors and councils under administration etc et they're usually due to what are generally termed governance failings so this focus on governance in council organizations is to be commended and, um, you know, I often look at, because I'm a local government geek, look at, look at org charts to see what is that CEO sending in terms of signals to the organisation, what's yeah. being elevated to report directly to the CEO, perhaps, um, you know, some, as I did when I was a CEO, had communications reporting directly because it was a particular focus. And yep. CEOs have uh, a real tool in their org chart to send those messages to the organisation about where they're going to put their focus and their priorities. I think they're powerful messages. Absolutely. Yeah, well said, Chris. Um, a nice roundup for the, for the session. That, that sounds like you've just wrapped me up, Steve. I have. <laughs> Good. I'm, I'm happy well, to be wrapped up. It's Friday night. Thank you. You're welcome. You have a great weekend. And you too. And we'll talk to you next week with more news. There's never a dull moment. There's always news coming from the local government world. And we'll be back to dissect it all next week with thanks to Hunt and... Why do they keep sponsoring this? Hunt and Hunt Lawyers, our terrific sponsors here on VLGA Connect. Have a great week. Thanks, Steve. Bye for now. Cheers, Chris.